Welcome to a presentation on Benjamin Franklin. I'm Craig Brody, past master of Columbia Lodge number 91. And there is Ben Franklin picture. And lower left, you see a statue of Brother Franklin and Brother Washington in front of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania from which I'm speaking now. And they were probably the two greatest founding fathers in American history. But this presentation will focus specifically on how Brother Franklin applied the teachings of Freemasonry and how he sets a great example for us to lead our lives today. The presentation will be approximately 30 minutes, and afterwards there'll be time for questions. It's also being recorded and will be available soon for playback on YouTube. You know, there's three major themes that run through the course of Ben Franklin's life. And that's what I'd like to present to you, how he worked on becoming a better man by improving his character and also his mind. And how throughout his life, he brought people together, a very unifying force, as well as how he served his fellow man. He felt the best way to serve God was to serve his fellows. Now those three major themes perfectly align with important principles of Freemasonry, which are self-improvement, practicing unity and fellowship, and performing acts of charity. So I'll start with self-improvement. In our fraternity, we emphasize to each other how we can improve ourselves, make good men better by building our character. And we do that one way by living according to certain virtues. So I'm listing here the Masonic virtues for temperance, moderation, fortitude, strength of purpose, prudence, wisdom, and justice, not doing injury. Also, in our rituals, we have symbolic tools that represent virtues, such as the square symbolizes that we take actions that are virtuous, and the compasses. This directly relates to temperance, keeping our desires in moderation. And we teach these symbols to our candidates during the rituals, as well as introducing the candidate to the gavel, which symbolizes ridding ourselves of vices and superficial things in life. Now these tools originally were aligned with the stonemasons of medieval time. Now, as Freemasons, we use them for symbols of not building churches and temples, but building character. Now, Ben Franklin, even before he became a Mason, was also interested in improving his character. And he came up with, as a hardworking printer in Philadelphia in the 1720s, a moral perfection plan. He wanted to make himself perfect, become a better man through living virtues. So he devised a list, not of four, but of 13 virtues. And he devised a book, which he carried around with him, filled with sheets of these virtues. His program was designed to live one virtue a week. So he started with temperance. Then the second week moved on to silence. He wanted to become a better listener. And then order, resolution, frugality, all the way to the 13th week, practicing humility. So by the end of the course, he would have gone through each virtue. If he fell short, if he made a fault, he would place a small black mark in his book. This idea was to run through his, this, this course several times throughout the year, four cycles in a year, with the end result being hopefully he'd have a clean book, free of faults, and thus achieve perfection. Well, as were none of us are perfect, neither was he. He admitted how tough it was to adhere to these virtues and how he did 
fall short and not meet his goal, but he felt that it did improve his character. And I think it comes across in one way, one example, is his evolving attitude towards slavery throughout his life. Initially, as he became wealthy as a printer and publisher in Philadelphia, he owned household servant slaves and made money from the slave trade by allowing advertisements for the sale of Negro slaves in his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. But then he started to turn against slavery, initially based on economic reasons, feeling that work allocated to Negro slaves would enfeeble the work ethic of the white man. And then gradually he turned against slavery for moral reasons. He helped to set up a school in Philadelphia to educate black slave children. And he visited the school one day. Of these children were equivalent in his mind to the learning abilities of the white children. And this, I'm sure, led to his turning around 360 degrees on the subject of slavery, because towards the end of his life, he was elected president of the Pennsylvania Society for promoting the abolition of slavery, and he even petitioned in the last year of his life that Congress end that practice. Now, self-improvement also involves obtaining knowledge. So in Freemasonry, we really value that through the practice of our degrees, our rituals, the teachings of Freemasonry, giving the candidate lessons in as he earns his degrees. And in one of the degrees, we emphasize learning a lot, that he study the seven traditional liberal arts, music, grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, astronomy, and last but not least, geometry. And we have the letter G in between the character building tools representing God, the supreme architect, and geometry, which was used by the stonemasons to help build buildings, and it's used here for us to study and expand our minds and prove our knowledge base. It says here in the bottom, one of the great objectives of our fraternity is to make knowledge useful, not only acquiring it, but to apply it to help our fellows. I think this really connected with Benjamin Franklin. That was a major theme. He had a thirst for knowledge throughout his life. Early on, he became interested in learning as much as possible. He didn't have much formal schooling, so he didn't know what he didn't know. And uh, he had a very curious mind, too. So he would study his natural world and be intrigued by it and conduct experiments and Learn from that too, besides books. And he wanted to take all that knowledge that he gained and made it useful to serve his fellows. As mentioned, serving God by serving his fellow man. So when he moved to Philadelphia from Boston as a teenager, he continued his reading. And in the club that he joined, he emphasized exchange of books. And this exchange of books grew into the first subscription library in America. In British America was the Library Company of Philadelphia, which still exists today. This is a picture of one of its early homes. Now, I think there's no better example of how Ben Franklin acquired knowledge and made it useful than in the example of electricity. Back in the 18th century, electricity was mainly an amusement, but he almost single-handedly turned it from an amusement into a sophisticated science. So when he retired from publishing and printing, a very wealthy, successful man at 42, he had more time on his hands for conducting experiments. He was real intrigued by electricity. So he set up a laboratory in his home 
and started studying it. And through his knowledge that he gained, he invented terms that we still use today, like battery and positive and negative charges and conductor. And he generated electricity in his laboratory. And he noticed that the characteristics of that electricity were similar to the characteristics of lightning. So he made some famous statement. Let the experiment be made to determine if lightning was a form of electricity. At the top here is my favorite Benjamin Franklin saying, well done is better than well said. He said it and he did it. He was a very practical man, so he made an experiment to see if light electricity or lightning was a form of electricity by mounting a wire on top of a kite. In his laboratory, he noticed how electricity was drawn to sharp pointed objects. So he mounted one on top of a kite, and at the base of the kite, bottom of the rope, string area, he attached the metal key. And he and his son in June of 1752, when Ben was in his 40s, went out to a field just west of here, just east of here, I'm with the Grand Line, just east of here, which is now downtown, of course, downtown Philadelphia. Then it was a field. He flew the kite in threatening storms. Sure enough, when clouds gathered, he noticed some of the strands of the string stood on end. He then, now this is an idealized picture, shows him as an old man, but he was in his 40s. He then applied his knuckle to the key and received what was probably a very pleasurable but mild electrical shock. He gathered that electrical charge, brought it back to his library, uh, laboratory, and then saw it had the same characteristics as the electricity he had generated, thus proving that lightning was a form of electricity. And the tremendous thing was he applied that knowledge. He made it useful by inventing the lightning conductor or the lightning rod. This is probably his greatest invention. Soon after that summer, 1752, lightning rods appeared on tops of buildings like Independence Hall and Christ Church and private residence. And the lightning rod was mounted on top, connected to a wire, and grounded it. Now, this was really helpful to his fellows. The lightning was conducted through the rod, sparing the building uh, lightning damage, structural damage from lightning strikes, sparing fires, preventing fires, and preventing deaths. It was a big problem back then in the 1700s. Many people died, and there were many fires from lightning strikes. But this helped alleviate his fellow sufferer. Great example. There are many others where he gathered knowledge and then made it useful, like in oceanography. In his passages between Europe and America, he studied the ocean currents, he took temperatures of the water, and through that knowledge made it useful by being the first to map the Gulf Stream. And this map was very helpful to ship navigators in their passages across the Atlantic, making it more efficient transit for them. Meteorology, he helped advance the budding science of meteorology. He studied the movements of storms, particularly nor'easters that come up the East Coast. And he deduced that the movement of these storms were opposite of the prevailing winds. That was very helpful to getting meteorology into a, eventually a full-fledged science. So why is self-improvement important to us today in the 21st century? Well, in terms of character building and living virtuously, it will help us become happier, increase and enhance our well-being. And that happiness will hopefully lead to greater understanding and acceptance of others and making this world a better place to live. In terms of acquiring and applying knowledge, I think we should be, like Ben Franklin, lifelong learners. We live in a world with fast-paced technology and 
hence competition from globalization. We need to learn as much as we can throughout our lives and hopefully make that knowledge useful to others. I take a page from Ben Franklin's book. I teach technology, teach software, Microsoft software to students. I try to make it useful for them so that they can take, by teaching it hands-on, so that they can take those skills and apply it to advance their careers and make them more successful. Now, another area that we value as Freemasons and Ben Franklin practice is fellowship and unity. We teach in our rituals that we should serve our fellow brothers and support each other's character. I was in Lodge the other day, and it was my job to confer a first degree. And one of the brothers came up to me, and he said, oh, I asked him, can you support me in case I slip? I have to memorize thousands of words. He said, I got your back, brother. Well, I thought that was a great example of how we support each other's character. We work together to support each other, and uh, without contention, at least we hope that's the goal, right? And work without contention, united, so we can achieve things. And we have a symbol here, another symbolic tool, which was used by stonemasons, but for us, it symbolizes unity and fellowship, the trowel. Now, before Ben Franklin became a mason in his 20s in Philadelphia, he practiced fellowship. He was a social creature. He really thrived on socialization. He created a club called the Junto in Philadelphia when he was 21 years old. And this club was sort of like Freemasonry. It had rituals, it was semi-secret, 12 other members. All of them were basically tradesmen and artisans. And they gathered together at a Philadelphia tavern every Friday night. Besides socializing, they would discuss knowledge, exchange philosophical topics, debate, and support each other's career. And he led this club for 30 years. And perhaps that led him to be initiated into Freemasonry. Soon after, 1731, still in his 20s, he became a Freemason. St. John's Lodge number one in Philadelphia. And then really engaged in its practices and was a committed, dedicated member for over 50 years, becoming quite rapidly the Grand Master of Pennsylvania, twice. And printing, you know, he was a printer, a publisher, the first to print Masonic book in America, Anderson's Constitutions. And even in his 70s, when he lived in France, he was master of his lodge, practicing fellowship for many years. He believed in unity as well. He took this concept of the junto and made it apply to throughout the British colonies by creating the American Philosophical Society in 1743, the first learned society in America, by uniting brilliant minds together, men who were experts in their field, to come together form a society, meet and exchange knowledge to expand the knowledge of the colonies, which still exists in Philadelphia. And speaking of unity, after his printing days were over and soon after his famous experiment with electricity, he became involved in politics and diplomacy. He was elected to the Albany Congress in 1750s and had a plan for uniting the British colonies in this Congress. Because back then, there was a grave threat to the colonies on the Western frontier from French and Indian attacks. And also, he wanted this uh, unification to be represented in a Congress. So this Albany Congress would elect delegates and send them to Congress where they can establish rules and regulate trades besides um, specifying a defense fortification setups and securing the defense. To promote his plan, he created perhaps the most 
famous editorial cartoon in American history, Join or Die. Snake represents the British colonies, and they're segmented or separated. And unless the colonies, parts of the snake, are connected, unless they join together and protect against threats on the Western frontier, for example, the whole body would die. All the colonies would collapse, join or die. Then he continued his unification efforts with a tremendous contribution to our country. He was elected delegate to the Constitutional Convention, Philadelphia and Independence Hall in 1787, and he played a major unifying role by helping to bring together the large state delegates and the small state who were bickering in a, con in a contentious debate over how much power should be allocated to the new Congress they were considering. The convention almost collapsed in disarray. But Franklin conveyed to the members that both sides needed to sacrifice some of their demands in order to achieve the common good, which was the Constitution. And that effort paved the way for the Constitution to be adopted and signed. So why is this concept of fellowship and unity important to us today in the 21st century? Well, like before, it encourages tolerance and understanding of others. We don't discuss religion or politics in our lodges, so we try to, that it fosters unity and fellowship. And it's important for us because we have red states and blue states and so much polarization in our society today. I think we can try to expand our concepts of unity and fellowship from within the lodge to without to help unite our disunited society and world. And finally, a major theme of Freemasonry and Ben Franklin's life is the subject of charity. In Freemasonry, we encourage members to donate their time. And one way is for them to become Shriners. You become a Freemason first, and then you can join the Shriners. Here's a group of Shriners who uh, are dedicating their time and efforts to raise money uh, for Shriners Hospital, as well as to put a smile on children's faces who are patients there. We also emphasize donating our financial resources to worthy causes. So here in Pennsylvania, we have the Masonic Charities of Pennsylvania, four major branches that we can give money and our time to the Masonic Temple, where I'm at right now in the library and museum to help preserve the fantastic relics and archives and artifacts that are located here. You can give money to support the Masonic villages, retirement homes throughout Pennsylvania to make the lives of the residents more comfortable, even though they may be struggling financially. And we can donate money to the Masonic Children's Home, help poor use, be, uh, help feed and clothe them, as well as other uh, efforts to make their lives better. And the Masonic Youth Foundation, we can give to that foundation, to, uh, which supports teaching kids leadership and empowerment skills. My Lodge, every year, funds children from impoverished Philadelphia neighborhoods to attend life skills camp in the summertime to foster their experiences and help them grow. So we certainly can do uh, donate our time and money. Ben Franklin's uh, efforts at donating his time and money were vast and enormous. One of his major themes throughout his life is charity. He donated his time to transform Philadelphia in the 1730s, 40s, and 50s, key areas where he lived here in the city. One was to create, as it says there, the first the true volunteer fire company within America, 1736 at plaques on Market Street, and that's where it was created. He was such a busy man in 1736 with his printing and publishing empire, but yet he found time to create a volunteer fire company where none existed in Philadelphia 
and put out fires with his fellows by carrying around leather buckets filled with water. Now, later on, when he was elected to, or connected to the Colonial Assembly in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Assembly, a Dr. Thomas Bond arrived in Philadelphia, seeking to set up the first hospital in America. There were none, and he needed funding to get it started. So he asked around and everybody pointed him to Ben Franklin. Franklin got behind the idea, was enthusiastic about a hospital whose mission was to serve the sick and the poor. And with his connection with the government, he was able to get them to agree to match the private donations of individuals to fund the hospital. Thus, the birth of the matching grant, which is so useful today in nonprofits. So individual Philadelphians gave their money, the assembly matched it, enough funds were raised, and Pennsylvania Hospital got started, which still exists, the first hospital in America. As I mentioned before, he was really interested in sharing knowledge, sharing books, and he wanted to help youth in Philadelphia learn important skills, practical skills, like the seven liberal arts. So he created the Academy of Philadelphia, and he had a plan for the courses that would be te taught, practical skills, and he found a building where classes could be conducted, and was elected president of the board of trustees. This academy grew and eventually evolved into the University of Pennsylvania. Last time I was on, well, recently on campus, uh, I note there were three statues of Brother Ben there. Maybe there's more. And this is one in front of the main building. So a great contribution there. And he also did not feel that the inventions he created should, should benefit personally from them. So he did not patent any of his inventions. The most famous, perhaps the lightning rod, to advance healthcare bifocals. To keep Philadelphians warm in the wintertime with an efficient fireplace, the Pennsylvania fireplace with a Franklin stove. And to entertain people, a musical instrument called the glass harmonica for which Beethoven and Mozart conducted or composed music for. So none of it was patented, and he was helpful to the end of his days, which came, the final day came April 17th, uh, 1790. And you can visit his grave here in Philadelphia, near where I stand, the Fifth and Arch Streets, the last resting place of Ben Franklin. He was 84 when he died here in Philadelphia. And Brother George Washington, on the plaque that you can see there, made a, made a great uh, comment, a great tribute to his fellow brother and friend, Ben Franklin. Venerated for benevolence. Ben Franklin was a man of benevolence and charity. Admired for talents. Brilliant mind, acquiring knowledge, making that knowledge useful to serve his fellow man. Esteemed for patriotism, helping to bring the delegates of the Constitutional Convention together to get the Constitution signed. Great diplomat to secure an alliance with France as well to help us win the Revolutionary War. Beloved for philanthropy, all the efforts of him to transform Philadelphia and his world through his inventions, through the academy, the hospital, the Volunteer Fire Company, and a lot more. And he even wanted to be useful after his death. He donated his salary as governor of Pennsylvania to his original hometown of Boston and his adopted hometown of Philadelphia. And in his bequest, he stipulated that the money be made available as small loans to tradesmen, like he was get their careers going. Just as he was benefited from a wealthy patron to get his printing career started. And those loans would be paid back with interest. He calculated through compounding of interest that after a long period of time, 
there'd be an enormous sum in the trust fund. And sure enough, there was. So he specified that after 100 years, the money be allocated to public projects. After 200 years, put into the public treasury. And Philadelphia used that money to fund the start of a great science museum in his name, the Franklin Institute. How is this important to us today, charity? Well, the way I see it is that Ben Franklin, as busy as he was, can donate his time for causes. We can find causes that we get behind and donate our time to make the world a better place, provide for those in need, fight poverty and disease, help to educate others. And our lodges, we, have, we support the troops by dropping some coins into the uh, donation box at our meetings. So in summary, the three major themes of Ben Franklin's life, becoming a better man, bringing to get people together, and serving his fellow man, align perfectly, beautifully, with what we consider very important in our fraternity, the Freemasons. Making oneself better through building one's character and mind, making that knowledge useful to others, practicing unity and fellowship, both in the lodge and out, and forming acts of charity. And we hope that by applying these principles and using Ben Franklin's life as an example, the world will be a better place. Thank you very much for attending the presentation. Benjamin Franklin applying the teachings of Freemasonry, setting an example for us today. I'm Craig Brody, past master at Columbia Lodge. There's my email if you have any questions. And thank you very much again for attending the presentation on Benjamin Franklin.